Good morning to everybody. I am Alessandra Venturini, the holder of the Jean Monnet Chair in European Migration Studies, hosted by the University of Torino and financed by the European Commission. I'm very glad today to introduce the seventh lecture of the Chair Satellite Seminar Consumption of Cultural Goods as Driver of MIGA Integration. The acronym is COCUMINT. And we are very ha happy and honored that Marco Di Martiniello have accepted to deliver the seventh lecture. In, the title is Cultural Participation and Local Citizenship. Marco Martinelli is very well known. It does not need an introduction. However, just to refresh his background, Marco is a sociologist and a political scientist. He, te he teaches sociology of migration and ethnic relations at the University of Liège. He is currently director of the Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research and director of the Center for Ethnic and Migration Studies, as well vice dean for the research of the Faculty of Social Science, University of Liège. Martiniello holds a, a BA in sociology, but a PhD in social, um, social political science from the European University Institute in Florence. He specialized in migration study, ethnicity, multiculturalism, integration, political participation, mobilization are his current interest. Minority, uh, sorry, mobilization of migrant minority to arts in a super diverse city. He has made also, he was visiting a, a number of universities like New York University, Columbia University, Malmo University, the City University of New York, University of Geneva, University of Kazulu Natal, University of Queensland, and many, many others. Beside his academic achievement, Martinello was also awarded by an important civil distinction, including the honorary citizenship of the city of Liège in 2015. And in 2017, Italy didn't want to be less important, so they, it gave him the knighthood of the Order of the Star of Italy. So, as you understand, we couldn't find any other scholar better suited for our program, um, for, for our series of lectures. So, Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for this invitation. It's a pity I cannot be with you there in Italy, but still, wow. The title of my presentation, Cultural Participation and Local Citizenship, I've added an ethnography of the Canal Zone in Brussels. Uh, this is actually uh, the result of a project we have developed with my colleague Elsa Mescoli uh, at CEDEM at the University of Liège. So let me start with a few elements about the context. Uh, this is uh, a research that was commissioned by the Brussels Planning Agency. The Brussels Planning Agency is the regional agency that basically uh, examines and uh, proposes uh, policies to develop the region of Brussels. As you know or don't know, uh, the region of Brussels is made of 19 cities that are attached one to another and all together they constitute the urban region of Brussels. Uh, the Brussels Planning Agency has a knowledge department, as they call it, and that department observes the socioeconomic and spatial evolution of the region in order to build a vision of Brussels' urban landscape with a view to develop regional planning. Uh, one of the problems Brussels has had is that uh, for decades, there was no unified urban planning. And so basically this explains why, for example, at the architectural level, this is a patchwork. You find all sorts of periods represented in a sort of harmonious sometimes, a disharmonious sometimes uh, chaotic uh, landscape. So uh, this um, Brussels Planning Agency and its knowledge department want to go further. Uh, they do sorts of diagnosis of different neighborhoods. And uh, in 2017 and 18, 
they made a precise diagnosis of five neighborhoods of Brussels. And uh, actually, for the first time, uh, that agency expressed the need to know more about cultural practices and participation in those five neighborhoods. I will say a few words about the neighborhoods in a minute. And in order to do so, uh, they uh, commissioned uh, uh, a research with the city of Brussels, the city of Molenbeek, which is one of the 19 cities that compose the Brussels region, the Brussels Network for the Arts, which is actually a network of all the cultural and artistic institutions active in the region, and the newly established museum Canal Pompidou. So this museum actually um, has been built with a partnership with the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and it's located right in the middle of these five neighborhoods. And uh, we applied and we won the bid with the University of Ghent, uh, which is on the Flemish part of, uh, of the country. And, um, the aims of the research we were asked to do uh, first was to get a better, load, better knowledge of the factors that impact the cultural participation in the area, including a better understanding of the cultural offer that is available uh, on the territory. Second, to get a, a better knowledge of the actual cultural practices in this area. And also, uh, it's they uh, the, the planning office found very interesting to try to elaborate typologies of practices and residents, of course, with reference to cultural participation. And the ultimate aim of all that is to integrate the cultural practices in the urban development of those areas. So this is actually a, a kind of uh, uh, new development because uh, it's actually the really first time that culture is put at the center of the debates about the development of the urban region of Brussels. So uh, I was telling you that we won the, pro the bid with uh, the University of Ghent. Uh, so we have worked two teams, KUDOS from the University of Ghent and SEDEM from the University of Liège. KUDOS was more in charge of a quantitative survey uh, in the neighborhoods, and we were more in charge of doing an ethnographic research in the neighborhood. And what I will tell you today uh, deals exclusively with the, um, the ethnographic research we developed. Of course, we worked uh, together regularly, uh, we shared information, we, uh, we did some interventions in the field together, but and Sometimes we saw that actually we were reaching almost the same conclusions, either by survey or by our ethnographic research, which in a way was quite uh, comforting uh, in many respects. So uh, this is a map, I don't know if you see it well, uh, of the, the neighborhoods. In blue, you see the canal that cuts Brussels in two. Uh, on this side, on the right side, uh, you have, I would say, uh, the, 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 the historical center, touristic center of Brussels, Brussels with the Grand Place, etc., the European institutions and so on. And the canal sort of divides the city in two. On the other side of the canal, you have uh, the three of the neighborhoods we are studying, uh, the Vieux Laken, the Quartier Maritime, Molenbeek, which is world famous now, has been since 2016 for other reasons, because the terrorists uh, from Paris and from Brussels, some of them were from Molenbeek, Gare de l'Ouest, and on the, right on the other side of uh, <coughs> the canal, the Quartier Nord, where is located Le Parc Maximilien, one of the major occupation of undocumented migrants for years in Brussels, in a park here, there were uh, at some stages uh, in 2016, about 5,000 migrants living in a park uh, without any facilities. 
So this is the this was the perimeter of the study we were supposed to uh, to examine. So uh, these neighborhoods uh, have many uh, common points. Uh, they have uh, all they are characterized by an industrial heritage. Uh, they are also because of the canal very close and in connection to the port of Brussels, which is not a seaport, but, but you know, a more an internal port, as they say. All the neighborhoods, the five neighborhoods we have worked on are very dense in terms of population and very mixed. Uh, the multicul multiculturality is very high. And you would have noticed already that the research was not framed as a study on immigration, but the fact that we study five neighborhoods in which the proportion of immigrants and descendants of immigrants is very high, in some places about 90%, uh, makes our study in large part a study about immigrant and immigrant pro uh, origin population too. These neighborhoods are also characterized by, by a quite high socioeconomic fragility. The rate of unemployment is quite high. Uh, these neighborhoods were, as I said before, industrial neighborhoods, and all the traditional industry, of course, have disappeared. And um, this created uh, yeah, a quite uh, persistent socioeconomic fragility. We also see that there is a process of redefini redefinition of the urban fabric and like we see in many other cities, a process of gentrification uh, in, in those neighborhoods. Another uh, point in common they have is uh, in all the neighborhoods, there is quite vivid social cultural life uh, in all sorts of different institutions, a diversity of institutional actors that are active in the field. Of course, there are differences between uh, these neighborhoods, for example, in terms of composition, ethnic and national composition of the population, but uh, they were chosen because in socioeconomic terms, they basically were facing the same uh, issues, the same problems, and sometimes the same mechanisms were appearing in the five neighborhoods. So when we defined uh, cultural practices, uh, we uh, adopted a very broad perspective. So uh, we, of course, um, are interested in uh, the activities of consumption or of participation in intellectual artistic life in a broad sense, where aesthetics plays an important dimension, whether we are talking about uh, theaters, museum, movie uh, theaters, uh, concerts, but also usage of new technology. But uh, on, on, another, uh, on another dimension, we, we thought it was uh, very important, was also to open up the study to uh, leisure activities, uh, which uh, are, in our view, to be considered as cultural in the sense that they define lifestyles and sometimes they are related to the cultural uh, identity of the groups uh, who uh, are present in these neighborhoods. And for example, you know, gardening and especially urban gardening is considered by us as a cultural practice as well. So basically, we are dealing both with cultural activities in a traditional sense, but also sociocultural activities in a broader sense. Uh, about the methodological tools we've used, uh, we worked uh, basically with uh, three uh, tools, in-depth interviews, both individual and collective, uh, participant observation and informal discussions, and also visual tools. And I will not uh, develop the first two points, but just, for example, mention that uh, one visual tool we, uh, we used uh, was maps. Uh, first of all, this is, these are a few pictures of the neighborhoods and of the things we uh, observed. Uh, so uh, you have uh, uh, 
markets were an important place in order to talk to the people. You know, uh, markets rhythm uh, the, the the social life in in these five neighborhoods. There are every day there's a different market in a different neighborhood. Uh, we visited all sorts of workshops, dance and painting and sewing and whatever, uh, cuisine, uh, concerts, you know, everything that really makes uh, uh, the, the, the social cult cultural life of a neighborhood. Uh, coming back to the visual instruments, we used the maps. So uh, and that was used, for example, to understand if people in the neighborhoods had a good idea of where the cultural institutions were located. And so we submitted a free map, you know, just like this, to people, and uh, we asked them to locate not only where they were, but also where they travel, where they move in the neighborhood, where they go for cultural activities. So here you just have an example. Uh, I must say that um, this is um, a seducing uh, tool, but it's, it's very difficult because, you know, many people are not able to read a map. Uh, we, they don't know where they are when you show them even the map of their neighborhood. So at the end of the day, uh, the researchers had to, to take them by the hand and to, to, to illustrate the map by walk because they just couldn't read it. But still, some of these maps gave us uh, interesting indica in indications about how people move in the neighborhood, what type of institutions they visit. So uh, globally, we did uh, 24 uh, in-depth interviews with local experts and users of the facilities. We did 21 participant observations of events, and there too we talked to users and the people who were in charge of these activities. We explored 20 places, it means uh, long observation uh, in, in different parts of these neighborhoods. In total, in this part of the study, we uh, touched 150 people. Um, in a qualitative uh, uh, research. So this is not about statistical representation. The quantitative study was based on uh, as much as possible on uh, statistical representation of the population of the neighborhoods. Uh, but I will not talk about that here because we haven't done that part of the study. So what is also interesting is that we were still gathering data when the first lockdown uh, was decided in March 2020, last year. And so uh, it was a bit of a problem because we had many interviews that were scheduled. We were many uh, particip participant observations that were scheduled. And so we had sort of adapt, we had to adapt. So we had, we continued to make some interviews online uh, and of course, we could not observe cultural events because they were all canceled. So we tried to find at least, you know, other material like uh, internet publications about the previous editions of the event, documentaries, pictures, videos, whatever. And we also added a specific uh, survey on how cultural institutions were trying to adapt during the first lockdown. And this is part of a, uh, another part of the, uh, the, the, the project that uh, we, are, we, are, we have now finished an article specifically uh, about that. I will come back a little bit to that in a minute. So in terms of the cultural offer in the neighborhoods, what do we have? We have all sorts of creative, creative workshops and recreative activities, you know, in small uh, sociocultural associations and, uh, and groups and so on, where they offer, you know, courses of, uh, I don't know, uh, sewing, of gardening, of uh, all sorts of things like that. Uh, museums, exhibitions and guided tours. Uh, there is on the territory of the neighborhood, there is a 
one of the most recent and most visited contemporary art museum. I think that uh, Alessandra, you were staying very close to the museum when you when you came last year. Uh, there's also on the on the perimeter of uh, the study uh, the the first Brussels Museum of Immigration, which uh, is also very interesting because um, uh, it was created by uh, uh, an association, an old association, with the participation of the people of the neighborhood. Uh, maybe I will uh, say a few words of that uh, later too. Theater and all sorts of performance spaces, uh, like some music venues, uh, cinema. When I say cinema, I'm not talking about the big, you know, movie theater that we see everywhere, everywhere in, in Europe now, but more about movie clubs where usually they show films and it's followed by a debate. You know, uh, you have to become a member and you can attend to these sessions. All sorts of art, sport, uh, art and sport classes, and then there are all sorts of under the radar cultural activities that are often uh, disregarded by studies because they are difficult to locate. Uh, I'm talking about, for example, weddings. Uh, there are on the territory of, um, or of the neighborhoods here, uh, there are uh, wedding venues uh, where um, uh, Moroccan and uh, for example, Congolese families organize their weddings. Well, these venues uh, can, could, because now it's, of course, it's not possible, could host more than sometimes 2,000 people. And usually in these ceremonies, there's a lot of music going on with live bands and so on. So uh, this is part of a cultural life that does not appear because it's not mentioned in the newspapers, it's not mentioned uh, in uh, the, the program of any institution, but it's a kind of equivalent to a concert sometimes. Uh, so this is, uh, we try to took that uh, into consideration, as well as all the uh, urban culture and street art culture. Uh, basically, there are many things that uh, are done and are followed in the streets, outside of the buildings. Uh, uh, many uh, Brussels is very famous also for hip hop, and all the disciplines of hip hop uh, are, uh, are represented. Some are more institutionalized, and some are really still at the street level and can be locally very popular and followed mainly by second and third generation uh, immigrants. In terms of the motivation, and I know that we know many things already about the motivation people have to participate or not to participate in cultural activities. Uh, the, the ethnography led us to confirm or maybe to add some, some elements to why people would participate or not. Of course, uh, I've, left this, I've left aside the uh, socioeconomic dimension, the fact of having money, etc. We know about that, and here some of the activities we observed and uh, we worked on uh, are are for free. So you sort of neutralize the the this mere financial uh, uh, obstacle, eventual potential obstacle to participation. Time is an important uh, dimension. Uh, whether you work or not, whether you are uh, you have a, a big family or not, well, there is more or less time to participate should you be interested. Uh, second, we've noticed that um, there's a link uh, between the type of activities outdoors, outside of the home, and the type of interest that people pursue when they are at home or at work. So basically, uh, people are interested in pursuing what they do in other contexts. You know, uh, I could take example: um, uh, people who do painting at home uh, will find probably uh, the way to identify where there is a painting workshop they could attend in order to pursue 
their activity in another context. Third element is that cultural practices sometimes are understood as a space for oneself, where people can just break away from the daily routine. And we've seen that uh, with many women, actually, who sort of did whatever they could to manage a space for themselves, where they could get away from the hassle with the kids and with the husband and uh, whatever, to do something either alone or with some friends that would have uh, a cultural uh, undertone. Um, some people who have very little to do uh, participate in some activities just to keep busy, to have something to do, to, to spend time. We found that too, as we found people who really wanted to learn to create. They had a kind of you know, potential, they wanted to learn techniques to do something, photography, filming, or whatever. In uh, the, the, amongst the participants, there we managed, well, we saw that there were at least two relevant groups. One we have called the hardcore participants. Uh, you have those people uh, who sort of have who sort of built in their cultural practice in their daily routine so whatever happens they will go to the activity they are registered to they will do it in any circumstance and those people for example were the most hit by the lockdown because the day of the lockdown they were calling the institution say well are we still on tomorrow for uh, the lecture or for whatever and of course, they had to be disappointed for uh, a certain uh, moment. And then there is a group that fluctuates, you know, people who participate once and then disappear and then come back and then disappear. Well, this is not necessarily problematic, but of course, in terms of planning of the activities, uh, and especially in smaller structures that do not have an annual uh, programmation, it, can be a problem. What is counterintuitive, though, in our study, because usually when we talk about cultural participation in immigrant populations, there is this idea that women stay at home, women, especially Muslim women, stay at home, are trapped prisoners of the, the family, uh, not in a strict sense, but in a, uh, in a broad sense. Well, we found here that uh, in our five neighborhoods, women participate much more than men. And so uh, this was confirmed both by the ethnography and by the quantitative uh, study. So it means that things are changing and sometimes that our image of immigrant women does not really correspond to the reality of today. Maybe the the idea of migrant women being at home 24 hours, seven days a week, uh, does not really correspond to the stage of the post-migration developments today. And uh, that was true in different uh, activities uh, that we, uh, we observed. So that, I thought that was uh, interesting to notice. Now, uh, because there is a link with citizenship, uh, what is the social significance of these cultural practices? We've noticed that for many people, cultural practices are not uh, are a means and not a, an end in itself. Basically, in many cases, the aesthetic dimension does not really matter a lot. People take part to socialize take part to meet other people, to exchange with other people, not necessarily because they want to see that exhibition in particular, but they would go and they would, especially often, they would go in small groups, sometimes in larger groups, in order to have a social life. So basically, culture, cultural practice, cultural conception is a way to give a different flavor to one's social life and to strive for an individual and a collective well-being. 
Remember, we are talking about neighborhoods where life is very difficult, because many people are flirting with the level of poverty. So we are not talking about upper class uh, levels. So lots of pressure of all sorts, and these cultural practices are seen as a way to to try to to have some light in in one's uh, difficult life. So. Um, We've noticed as well that there is a strong request to um, be part also of uh, the programming of the content that will be shown. People like are not very happy in just being seen as consumers of culture. They would like to have a word in deciding what will be the content that will be proposed to the population. And some of the institutions have developed uh, mechanisms to negotiate, to discuss what will be the, uh, the program of the next part of the season or of the next season. So um, in that way, um, ac cultural activities could be seen to reinforce uh, active local uh, citizenship. And of course, to promote the personal and community uh, development. There, in all the neighborhoods, and this is a confirmation of things we knew before, there is a strong feeling of belonging to the neighborhood. And um, people are very much attached to the history of their neighborhood. And uh, when the institutions stage that, for example, migration history, this is very successful. It means that uh, arts is used in a way to build a kind of local citizenship uh, also based on the history uh, of, uh, of, of the neighborhood. The case of Molenbeek is, a, is very clear about that, uh, where people will never say in Brussels, I am from Brussels. They will always say the, the neighborhood they are from, uh, one of the 19 and even uh, more neighborhoods that uh, that compose that city. And um, basically, culture links people. It's seen also as a means to stay in touch. We saw that very much when the lockdown um, uh, was, uh, was decided. Um, people felt sort of abandoned. And as I said before, people started to contact the the, the, the institutions in the neighborhood saying, what's going to happen now? We, we need to continue, we need to do something. And in some cases, the cultural institutions, after a stop for a few weeks, they started very quickly to imagine new ways to stay in touch, to organize online uh, uh, gatherings and online shows. And sometimes towards June of last year, they organized uh, outdoor activities with the respect of all the measures, of course. Uh, and I remember one of the festivals I attended to, which is not far from where I live, just outside the perimeter, uh, a cultural center of the area organized a music concert for the end of the season that they entitled Basta Corona. Well, they were, the, the festival didn't help to solve the sanitary crisis, but it was attended by people who really, they didn't care about what music they were about to listen to. They didn't care about, uh, about that. What they cared was to find a place where they could talk to each other, exchange about the difficult times, and maybe about the solutions to get out of it. So there's a clear um, social significance of many cultural practices. So we uh, drew a, a few conclusions. Um, the first uh, conclusion is that the audiences are in the majority in activities that directly target them. So the notion of targeting is very important. You know, for example, the people of the new museum canal, they did not understand why people from the neighborhood would not visit the museum because they were not the target of the museum. It's, it's very difficult to, to enter a museum of contemporary art 
when you know there's been you've you don't necessarily have the codes and so on and you think that this place is not for you anyway second uh, element is um when there is a process of co-construction of contents it helps people to participate and to reappropriate uh, the events of course we noticed also tensions around certain uh, contents uh, especially when there is no possibility or choice to avoid that content uh, the issue of nudity for example uh, where uh, you know, some women we uh, we had uh, contacts with thought well had the feeling that they were. It was not fair that in order to go into their class of sewing, that to go through an exhibition where there were paintings of naked people. And so, what the tension was about was not that there was that the, that exhibition that was not a problem. The problem that they was that they felt that they were forced to visit that exhibition, which was in contradiction to their values or to what they think uh, they can uh, watch or accept. So, um, and sometimes these tensions are solved just by negotiation between the people and the, the organizers. Uh, if we want to make people participate more, proximity work is very important. And actually, uh, we've seen that in the neighborhoods, the cultural institutions are very committed to the neighborhood. Of course, now there is a decree in Belgium about cultural participation and uh, the institutions are forced to reach out to the population. But uh, here uh, we had... Uh, you know, more than the impression that it was not uh, an obligation. It was really part of the cultural institutions to actually, they see themselves both as cultural institutions and as social institutions at the same time, very committed to the development of the neighborhood. And generally, and this is quite also counterintuitive, is that uh, the view uh, the cultural institutions have of the neighborhoods is very positive. They stress the dynamism and the cultural wealth of the neighborhood, whereas from the outside, these neighborhoods are seen as dangerous and uh, sometimes places to avoid. So, and this is the case of Molenbeek. You know, Molenbeek was depicted also in Italian TV as uh, the world capital of jihadism no-go area and so on. Well, when you are there, you move there, you talk to the institutions and to the citizens, they have a very different view of uh, the neighborhood. They stress more the dynamism. For example, uh, in Molenbeek, this is one of the, the place where new technologies developed uh, the most rapidly. And some of the innovations actually have been developed by um, second generation immigrants uh, starting from 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 nothing from a small association they created these hubs of uh, new technologies and even macron visited them uh, from france he came to 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 visit the, that uh, new technology hub to try to inspire some of the french banlieue in terms of uh, cultural participation of course we know that the personal circumstances of individual uh, plays an important role. Uh, I mentioned uh, time. Um, I think that you know what one thing also we we should avoid is um, to sort of have a kind of obligation to participate, to put an obligation to participate on the shoulders of the citizens. You know, we know that generally people participate, but people also have the right not to participate. And we, and sometimes there is a discourse that stresses, you know, the non-participation of specific groups, even though it does not correspond to uh, uh, to the reality. 
So uh, just before uh, finishing, we also ended our report with some recommendations to prospective Brussels. The first one was to develop financial measures and incentives, but also to inform people about existing financial measures to support cultural participation. Why is that so? Because some people, sometimes we know there is a financial obstacles to take part in some cultural events, but many times they don't even know that they could get a subsidy to take part in the events. So information about the sources that exist is important too. Uh, I mentioned the low social dimension of cultural activities. Uh, what we thought was important as well is the idea to formalize collaboration agreements between cultural and social institutions that involve also local residents and the issues they want to raise. So uh, it's very good when, for example, a cultural center and uh, the local center for social aid work together uh, in, uh, in order to try to basically involve the population and provide cultural contents that appeal to them. Uh, another element that we thought was, would be useful is that uh, maybe to ensure a greater diversity of sociological profiles in the structure, managerial structure of the social and cultural institutions. So we are in neighborhoods where the proportion of immigrant and immigrant origin population is very high. But when you go into the, the decision uh, level in the social and cultural institutions, then it's almost all white. And uh, this is a kind of mismatch which is often underlined by the citizens. And then, of course, we had this huge debate about the contents. You know, uh, it's very difficult. Um, but I think that um, the idea is to to find spaces where people could participate and without being judged by participating or by not participating in this or that event. So trying to, well, to, to create welcoming spaces that respect the needs of participants and not necessarily endorse a kind of uh, cultural democratization, uh, from the top that would sort of impose any view of what the national culture is uh, to everybody in the neighborhoods. And therefore we need to offer diversified content and give the choice to participate. As I said before, nobody, everybody should have the right not to participate. And uh, a few other elements here that uh, are very important. The last one I want to, uh, to underline is that um, there's a need to go further in creating safer and more accessible spaces, especially for families and children, uh, because um, these are, that specific aspect is probably, is probably missing in uh, the five uh, neighborhoods. So we presented the, the results, we presented the report, um, and actually it was very, very, very well received. And now we see in the future how culture will be really integrated in the plans that will be uh, developed to, to renew, to redevelop these neighborhoods that have suffered for a long time now. And that clearly we, we, we are convinced that culture can play an important role, uh, not only for the population, but for the redevelopment of the total region of Brussels, uh, the 19 communes and the whole region. And with that, I close with a nice image of the canal zone and the new developments that we see there. Uh, that haven't stopped during the COVID. The, the neighborhood continues to change on a daily basis almost. Thank you very much.
Oh, Marco, thank you very much. Uh, this presentation was very, very interesting. Uh, it's producing a lot of thoughts. Um, this idea that uh, arts uh, and occasion are fundamentally producing well being and socialization, and for that reason, should be pursued, should be organized. So, without any educational uh, project, you said something like that. So, I have the feeling that this project is more your idea is that. Uh, uh, the cultural services provide, produ pro provided or organized in an area should be make people happier, uh, being more bonding than uh, bridging. So there should be more done with the priority of the well-being of the people that are there. Um, uh, I absolutely agree with you from a practical point of view. You see, you had to start for the people, uh, for all the goods that people like. However, I have the idea that um, uh, art should also try to open the mind of people, should have an educational <laughs> role, opening them to other type uh, of uh, expression uh, of art, but also to other type of vision. So I would like, I know that Enrico Bertacchini has other questions for you. Uh, and so, but the idea is that art can uh, produce well-being in, pe in people and this create, uh, enhance the ability, the productivity, the ability also uh, in uh, self-esteem, social life and so on is uh, now becoming very popular and but i have also the idea that art can propose something that is difficult to teach you see it is difficult to teach soft skill and the one that we mentioned are fundamental the soft skill they are in they are um, uh, obtain with the participation of cultural good but art can also teach uh, I would say content uh, in an emotional way, which is much easier to understand also without uh, a language uh, barrier. So I think that contemporary art frequently, more than classic art, but contemporary art frequently uh, try to express an idea. And Pistoletto in his work, The Third Paradise, trying to express an idea and probably this is an idea that probably people didn't had in their mind so okay you understand is is with is useless that i repeat so i would say not only bonding but also bridging mm. i leave the you can all discuss the question together or yeah maybe i'll answer to that of course i couldn't mention all the elements of the the research but uh reaching out, you know, opening up the perspectives and so on, is something uh, many cultural institutions do. For example, uh, some institutions organize uh, visits of museums or institutions outside of the neighborhood. For example, a group of ladies goes to Le, Le Palais des Beaux-Arts, you know, the temple of high heart in Brussels. And they go, they would never go on their own. But if there is a group that is organized from Molenbeek to go to the Palais des Beaux-Arts, then they go. And then they are uh, accompanied, they are guided, they are submitted to different things that they would not know in the neighborhood. So that's, uh, it's a kind of way also of bonding. The idea is not to, uh, of a bridging, I would say, not only of, of bonding and staying inside the, the, the perimeter of uh, of the neighborhoods so there was that aspect too in the, in the, the research as to yes the same with contemporary art you know that museum that was very near to your hotel uh, initially it was uh, visited only by people coming from outside the neighborhood you know the the people upper middle and upper class from outside the neighborhood and then associations started to take kids in the museum from the neighborhood 
And now actually, well, then many of them uh, really loved it. They, they grasped immediately the languages that were represented there. And some of them started and are becoming artists just because they did that. They went, they visited, and, and now it's very popular in, in, uh, in the neighborhood uh, for, of course, not for every citizen. It can never be like that. But some people even have discovered that they have inside of them things they could express also by using forms like plastic arts or whatever. So this uh, this plays a role as well. Yes, sure. Yeah. Enrico. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, well, I it was very interesting as a as a presentation uh, and case study, and also for the approach uh, as a cultural economist uh, dealing also a bit with the uh, multidisciplinary perspectives on understanding cultural phenomena, I perfectly understand the complexity on measuring, mapping cultural practices. This is indeed something that, for example, also in a research project with Alessandra in uh, trying to, to uh, understand cultural consumption uh, patterns and engagement uh, in uh, in uh, people living in Torino from different with multicultural backgrounds uh, and profiles, uh, we realize how difficult it is to 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 uh, to have a, a clear idea on their on their behavior and attitudes on this uh, on this aspect. I, I would like to ask one thing that uh, um, is also based a bit on, on uh, the thoughts that we and the research that we have developed so far. Uh, have you in your in your research, ethnographic research and interviews, uh, have you perceived that there were some differences due to the uh, different cultural backgrounds of the groups living in the neighborhood? Uh, because well, the what you presented in terms of findings are mm, quite uh, horizontal or general for many groups, but uh, I think that uh, understanding or if you can uh, spend some words on this would be very useful. Uh, imagine that, uh, that the neighborhood is a very diverse uh, neighborhood, yes. and uh, and so if you could uh, see some difference also in the answer in the observation that you made. And the second one, uh, and the second point is uh, also uh, this can be more horizontal as a, as an issue. But uh, if uh, in uh, in the analysis that uh, your research team conducted, uh, you were able also to notice differences in uh, cultural practices that were done uh, uh, in the neighborhood or in the private life, but. Uh, uh, in, in the physical world, uh, or how the digital means uh, uh, yeah. somehow affected these uh, cultural practices, even loosely labeled uh, or defined, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, on uh, the first point, um, as I said before, it seemed to us that the gender played a more important role than cultural background. Uh, also, we've seen in the, 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 the observations and so on, that uh, we find in the cultural activities, the mixity we find in the neighborhood. But it's a national origin mixity or racial mixity or whatever, but uh, less a gender mixity, if you know what I mean. So it means that gender is probably more relevant in those neighborhoods than the cultural background um, and yeah we were really uh, struck by the fact that many of the activities were very mixed in terms of attendance in mixed in terms of national and cultural origin but not really mixed in terms of uh, of gender and one thing is that you know the men are really much much less active and uh, so the issue is there too, that to what extent does uh, culture helps to change gender relations maybe, 
well, we haven't gone as far in this research, but um, yeah, we we saw these cultural activities again in a specific set of neighborhoods as uh, reinforcing the cultural mixity than the opposite. That's what we've observed. But I will not generalize to uh, other contexts, of course. And uh, yes, the question of digital participation and so on, it was really um, very important for us when the lockdown was uh, decided. Because there, uh, it took another dimension, another visibility. And when uh, um, some cultural institutions decided to move online, and uh, there clearly there were people who were following because they had no, not only the know-how, but also uh, the, the computer and the good connection and so on, while others uh, were left aside. And uh, la fracture numérique, as they say in French, uh, was revealed again by the lockdown. We didn't see it before in our research because maybe we were focused on, on traditional forms of participation. So there might be a bias there uh, that, that was in part corrected after the lockdown. Thank you. I can't hear Alexandra anymore. Sorry, I uh, think that Jenser Schneider has a question. Yes, hello everyone. and. Uh... Very nice to hear your presentation, Marco, uh, and nice to be at this round. <laughs> um, yeah, I have two concerns, probably. I don't know if it's really correct. Yeah, it's also connected to your question. Have you ever done um, sort of comparative research between neighborhoods that have sort of, this sort of kind of social cultural activities and those that don't have? Because, I mean, there's, of course, this sort of question of what is the actual effect that this, that cultural programs have? and uh, and I'm not referring so much on the individual level. We know that there are these sort of psychological positive effects of cultural uh, activities. But I, I have a feeling, at least let's say from our research also in Germany and, and, and looking into different very similar projects that are around uh, in, in, in many parts, it is more an intuitive understanding that it is good to have these cultural activities and that it is good for people to participate. But what is, what it actually means is, I'm not sure if we, if, if anyone is really able to answer that question. And this is connected to my second question, which is the issue of uh, scaling up. It's, um, it's because your project is part of a, of a, of an urban planning uh, project. So the idea is to implement things that make neighborhoods better. So I'm. I'd say always concerned with that question, how can we, when we know that this and this works, that let's say that art courses are good for female participation. So how can we, shouldn't we, let's say, strive to make it a, a structural thing, that it is there for everyone, that it is offered, that we try to invite people for, uh, to this. Or we know that, let's say, to learn a, a musical instrument is good for in, for children's development in, 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 in a lot of, of, of aspects. So shouldn't there be, uh, let's say, structural mechanisms so that every child learns an instrument, like every child is in, engaged in sports? And I know of projects that try to do that, but I, I have the feeling it's like, so you go into a, a diverse and a marginalized neighborhood and then you offer violin courses to, and you, you have 15 children, you're very proud that you have 15 children in your, in your violin courses, but this is not really a structural change, I would say. No? This is not really scaling up. And I wonder if that dimension is part of that project that, uh, that is also sort of the bridge yeah. or the, the umbrella for your research project, or if you can contribute to that. Yeah. Uh, well, on your first question, we we could do some comparisons between the five neighbors in the study, uh, but that were in the per perimeter of the study, but we couldn't compare that with other parts of Brussels because yeah, it was not just part of uh, of the contract, so to say. So, uh, and we could see that there were 
differences between the five neighborhoods uh, uh, clearly now about the outcomes of that uh, i think that the um, the idea is probably well there are debates within the 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 political class in uh, political the governance in, in brussels there are debates and brussels perspective is pushing they want to to push for structural change the reason why for the for brussels as such the 19 communes the reason why they focused uh, on these five neighborhoods uh, were uh, because you know they are often considered as the most problematic areas and so the idea may be is to you know to convince that even in these places there is a good starting point to implement structural change um, but you know as i said what will be done with this uh, will they come up with uh, measures like the one you you talk about i don't know uh, what we saw also is that the people in the neighborhood uh, were sometimes a bit reluctant because i mentioned gentrification so one uh, sometimes people the first attitude was to say oh, okay so you're working for the planning office so it means that you are here to prepare even more gentrification so uh, we had to to explain that that was not uh, that was not the case but um, yeah what we the conclusion we can draw we can draw them only for these five neighborhoods that's clear now i think th that maybe that could be useful to discuss at the the level of uh, of brussels altogether but also to engage in a comparison or uh, exchange of practices with other cities because some of the things we have observed in brussels i can observe also in liege uh, uh, very similar things uh, but now beyond all that there is this idea and this it is a bit paradoxical that cultural can play a role in a develop in urban development but at the same time for a year all cultural institutions have been shut so it means that on the one hand the government say well culture is a priority and on the on the other end the decisions that have been taken in the framework of the the sanitary crisis, uh, crisis tell us that culture is not considered to be that important because most of the institutions have been closed for more than a year now so there is an ambiguity in the political discourse that um, you know could lead to further tension uh, in the future but many other things has been closed shops uh, restaurants uh, 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 productive activities universities and so on so i would say that is not a contradiction by the government they shut everything no, no, so, here, not here university have never been closed and uh, uh, schools are very have been closed on a very limited uh, period <clears throat> shops are open uh, basically, for many of the other sectors, there was some opening at some stages. Uh, in the cultural sector, apart from museums, all the rest has been sort of shut down for a very, very long period. So, and now actually, well, we see trends in the cultural sector that, well, some theaters have decided that they will reopen anyway. Uh, the 27th uh, so we will we will have this opportunity in a, more or less in a month in a month so they promise us they reopen uh, the theater the cinema the concert hall but with the minimum the smaller number of people yeah. but really I hope because uh, uh, we always go online we you can visit museum online and this has changed a lot the type of consumption because uh, even sometimes people that before were not going staying home uh, they profit uh, of this type of new consumption which is however different that is needed to say is different is something else
So I want to thank everybody. Marco, thank you very much thank for you. this uh, very challenging uh, lecture. And um, I hope to see you again. Jens, thank you very much for the participation. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.